Americans' unequal share of unpaid care work and the resulting impact on their human rights. I want to first thank my co-organizers, um, so the UN Special Rapporteur on, Extre of Ex on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights, the Center for Women's Global Leadership, and the Institute of Development Studies for helping us to organize this event. I should introduce myself. Um, my name is Rachel Moussier, and I work with ActionAid International. So this meeting is an opportunity to discuss why unpaid care work is so critical to women's rights and gender equality. We hope to have a hands-on discussion today about how we can use the UN Special Rapporteur's report to ensure that women's unequal share of unpaid care work is a key issue addressed in any post-2015 SDG agenda. The issue of women's unpaid care work was ignored in the MDGs, but we cannot afford to make this mistake again. If we want to see the post-2015 framework bring about transformational change on women's rights and gender equality. Our speakers today are coming from different organizations, such as UN Women, Academia, Civil Society, and from their different perspectives, they will tell us how we can make the most use of this opportunity created by the UN Special Rapporteur's report to lobby national governments, other UN agencies, and civil society partners on the centrality of women's unpaid care work in the post-2015 SDG agenda. I hope that they will also alert us to any challenges we will be facing along the way. I will keep this introduction brief, um, as we also want to hear, have some time at the end to hear from you about any ideas or questions you have to take this issue forward. So I'm going to introduce um, the speakers today, and they will each take up the floor. So our first speaker, and we're very pleased to have her with us, is Magdalena Stepovada Carmona, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on Extreme Poverty and Human Rights since 2008, and a fellow at the United Nations Research Institute for Social Development. In her latest report as Special Rapporteur to the UN General Assembly, Magdalena presents heavy and unequal care responsibilities as a major barrier to gender equality and to women's equal enjoyment of human rights. She's lobbying states, international organizations, and human rights advocates to address the issue of care as a matter of priority, as a major human rights concern. Second, we have Shara Razavi, who is the Chief uh, of Research and Data Section at UN Women. Thank you very much for joining us. Previous to joining UN Women, Shara was the research coordinator at UNRISD. During this time, uh, Shara specialized in the gender dimensions of social development, with a particular focus on livelihoods and social policies. Many of you who are interested in unpaid care will be familiar with the political and social economy of care research program Shara spearheaded while at UNRISD. I know I have referred to those documents many a time. Um, Next, we have Deepta Chopra, who is a research fellow with the Institute for Development Studies in the UK, where she focuses on rights-based policies and programming in South Asia. Her current research interests include a focus on gendered political economy analysis of policies for the empowerment of women and girls, and the core links between unpaid care work and women's and girls' economic empowerment. She's the lead researcher on a project which seeks to understand the ways in which development policy can be shaped to make unpaid care work visible specifically in six countries, Bangladesh, Indonesia, Kenya, Nepal, Nigeria, and Uganda. And finally, but by no means least, is Radhika Balakrishnan, which many of you may already know, is the executive director for the Center for Women's Global Leadership. Previously, she was professor of economics and international studies at Marymount Manhattan Youth College. In October last year, Radhika co-chaired the UN Women and Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean expert group meeting on structural and policy constraints in achieving the MDGs for women and girls, which identified some of the key policy priorities and critical issues for the post-2015 agenda. She's currently on the board of the Center for Constitutional Rights and the International Association for Feminist Economics, and was the chair of the board of the US Human Rights Network from 2008 to 2012. So we have a very, we are very privileged to have a, such a wonderful group of women to take us through this agenda. So please join me in welcoming them and starting off this discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning. It's a, it's a really great pleasure for me to be here and, um, and to be here with, uh, with this panel. I have to tell you that the work of uh, the report was based in large part on the research that Radhika, Deepta, Shara, and Rachel have done. So basically, then we, we all need to hear them uh, instead of me. What I'm going to try to do now is to, uh, to basically make the point and the link with human rights and what we need to do next to ensure that unpaid care work is taken into account in, in the future. What I'm going to stress and what the report does, and we move this a little bit, is to show that the difficulty, the intensity, and the gender distribution of unpaid care work create and perpetuate an equal rights enjoyment and gender inequality and cause human rights violations. What I'm going to try to explain briefly first is that this difficulties, intensity, and uh, an equal share of unpaid care work violate several obligations that the state have voluntarily assumed in a number of human rights treaties, from the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, to the International Covenant on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, and the Convention of the Right of the Child, among others. I'm also going to uh, explain try to show that when I refer to the rights that women do not enjoy equally than men because of the bulk of unpaid, because they're doing the bulk of unpaid care work without the support of the state or men, um, there are also other people impacted. And those who are, uh, the other people impacted are those who receive care. Care is, a re is relational. In many ways, the rights of caregivers are symbiotically interwoven with the rights of the care receivers. So when women are overburdened by unpaid care work that is not supported by the state or men, this has a direct impact on those who are receiving care. They will be uh, less able to provide quality hair, care and the rights of children, persons with disabilities, older persons, or even able bodies that receive the care are also impacted. <coughs> I think that it's very important to stress that unpaid care is really one of the missing pieces in the debate about empowerment and women's rights. And we have to tackle it up front. In my view, it is very difficult to think of a human right that is not negatively impacted by the unequal distribution and lack of support of unpaid care. So, for example, if we think about the right to paid and decent work, this right for women is obstructed in many ways by unpaid care. The heavy unpaid care responsibilities is the major obstacles for women taking on unpaid uh, pay employment or starting an income generating activity outside the home. For example, in a study in Latin America and the Caribbean, where I'm from, over half of women between 20 and 24 do not seek work outside the home because they're performing unpaid care work. Not only this, the fact that they are performing the bulk of unpaid care work restrict women's opportunities for professional advancement, limits their pay level, and increases the likelihood of ending up on informal and insecure jobs. The, the right of education for girls is also threatened from a very early state. In most extreme cases, girls are pulled out of a school to help to work in the, work and in the household or to take care of uh, youngest children. More often, though, girls' chances to achieve equally in education are constraints because of domestic responsibilities, leave them with very little time to studying, networking, doing extracurricular activities, or even having leisure. Without equal educational opportunities, 
they will have unequal learning outcomes and therefore it will be more difficult for them, both girls and women, to get access to well-paid, decent jobs that could enable them to lift themselves out of poverty. The right to health is also a major concern. There is only so much little care that a person can give without damaging her own access to health. Unpaid care work it can be stressful, emotionally difficult, arduous, and even dangerous. That thinks that the fumes from cooking uh, stoves is a major health risk. And it's, it comes to no surprise to you that respiratory infections is a leading cause of death for women and girls. The right to social security, it's also at stake. For the right to social insurance, the contributory part, women, due to care responsibilities, are, um, are sometimes going in and out to the labor market, so they have less retirement investment. Uh, but not only that, it also happened that for um, the, the consequences of this is that women's reward for a lifetime spain, spending caring of others in the majority of cases is poverty. But there are many other rights that are negatively impacted by unpaid care work. Let's think, let's think of the freedom of association, the rights to water and sanitation, the amount of time that uh, girls and women spend fetching water, for example. Um, other rights are, for example, the right to enjoy the benefits of scientific progress. The lack of access to infrastructure and technology, including water and sanitation facilities, uh, electricity, and domestic technologies, exacerbate the time that women have to dedicate to unpaid care work. And because unpaid care work is not uh, recognized and uh, is undervalued, governments rarely make investment in development uh, and, distribu and distribution of affordable technology like uh, meals and food efficient <coughs> stoves uh, or building basic infrastructure in rural uh, areas or in uh, underprivileged uh, urban areas to facilitate the work of women. But I would say that somehow the most important of all is the right to participation. Women were not taking part globally of the decisions that are running our communities, our uh, states, our governments, and in general. Also, we are not part in uh, fairly represented in the private sector uh, boards of directors. But one significant factor inhibiting women's capacity to be further involved in public and pri private uh, and political life is the care work that ties them to the home and the main failure to share it and the lack of services to support it. <coughs> I think that it's also important to stress that men, that gender stereotype that put the burden of care on women, also negatively impacted on men who experience social pressure to be the breadwinner, uh, providing for their fam uh, fin family financially mm -hmm. rather than caring for them most directly. Therefore, it is critically important that the uh, state play a greater role uh, in regulating, funding, and supporting care. Uh, care needs to be considered a collective responsibility and not only women's responsibility. It has to be better value, supported, and shared. Of course, this uh, is linked to uh, some social norms and it is uh, linked to the uh, more uh, structural gender discrimination that uh, women suffer all around the world. And this requires some time, more time, to change this, uh, this gender. But there's many more things that states can do to first fight for gender stereotype, for negative gender stereotype, in order to try to change them, and also some to implement public policies that will better support, distribute, 
and, uh, uh, and recognize the work uh, that women are doing in regarding to unpaid care work. And let me finalize this, this short presentation by linking it and stressing the needs that we have to take this issue here at, at this Commission of the Status of Women. And we also need to take the issue for the post-2015 Global Development Agenda. So, first, I welcome the fact that the zero draft of the agreed recommendation include unpaid care work quite prominently. However, it is everybody's work now to lobby hard states during this 58 session to ensure that the final recommendations are going to have a very strong language on the better recognition, distribution, and share of unpaid care work. Ideally, we would like to see, I would like to see, that the recommendations of the CSW will call on the states to incorporate unpaid care and under a standalone goal on gender in the post-2015 development agenda. That the SDGs will include unpaid care work. And how this can be done? Well, I hope that by now there is at least, it seems to be some sort of agreement to have a standalone goal on gender. And we have to keep on fighting for that. We know for experience that what is not included or what it was, was not included in the MDGs, it didn't exist. There was no political will and there was no money to push for issues that were not included in the MDGs. And we don't want this to happen in regard to unpaid care work. We want a standalone goal on gender and we want under that standalone goal on gender a target for better recognition, redistribution, and support of unpaid care work. And we also want, and we have to fight uh, for, having specific targets regarding unpaid care work in the SDGs. And these targets can be, for example, the, uh, the proportion of time, the, I lost my notes here, but it will be the, the, the time that I will take them to give you exactly the exact wording so you will write it down and you will love it for that. I'm not going to take the risk of getting something that is not uh, what we should fight for. So I took my notes, everybody writing it down. This is what we need to love it for. First, the indicators on. First, the average weekly hour spent on unpaid domestic and care work by sex. Second, the proportion of the average weekly hour spent on unpaid domestic and care work by sex. That's number one. Number two, the proportion of households within 15 minutes of the nearest water source the proportion of households within 15 minutes of the near, nearest water source. And third, the proportion of children under primary school age in organized childcare. The, purport, the proportion of children under primary school age in organized childcare. These are the indicators proposed by UN Women, and we have to support them. We have to lobby the delegates. Now, as I said, to get in the CSW a very strong message that the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goal, should have a standalone goal on uh, gender equality, women's rights and women's empowerment. Under that, we want an indicate a target to recognize, reduce, and redistribute and pay care and domestic work, and we have the specific indicators. There are some also some optional indicators, for example, but for very important for some regions and some countries, like the average weekly time spent on firewood collection by sex, and the average weekly time spent on water collection by sex. So we have to do our homework. I will be doing this week this homework, and I'm doing lobby 
but we need to ensure that this missing uh, development, this link and for women empowerment is up front. It is in the is it should be included here in the recommendation of this session of the CSW, but we have to be very ambitious and fight for the SDGs and we have to to link the two fights. We have to ensure that every time that we lobby delegates here for the inclusion of unpaid care work in the, S in the CSW, we're also talking of the need of getting them uh, committed to have that in the uh, SDG discussion. We need champion, I'm sure that we can find them in, in <coughs> government position. And, uh, and you're going to be so charming that you're going to convince all of them <laughs> that they have to do it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Magdalena, we're going to quiz you in terms of those three indicators afterwards. <laughs> I'm going to invite Shara to come up next. Thank you. Thank you. That's a very difficult act to follow, but I hope to carry on with the messages about lobbying at different levels, and I'm going to be ending a little bit talking more about the national level as well, but I think we need to think about what's happening in the capitals and at the country level despite the very importance of the global level as well. Um, so first of all, I'd just like to begin by, by saying that actually Magdalena's <coughs> report has, you know, as those of you who haven't read it, please do read it. It's, it is an amazing report. And yes, it draws on a lot of the research that us and others have done, but it also makes uh, the kind of linkages to human rights that our research at least have not done. And I'm, and I'm really, really, um, very impressed with the way that the report has done it. It provides very strong evidence, very, very ar you know, articulate and clear analysis mm -hmm. as to why and how um, the unequal division of unpaid care work between women and men within societies, but also between different social groups, between poorer households and more affluent households, there are also inequalities of class. And how these inequalities obstruct the realization of women's rights and here she talked about the right to education, the right to decent work, the right to social protection, and very importantly, even the right to political participation. Um, and uh, women's uh, rights to an adequate standard of living. So, so it is a very important um, um, issue to bear in mind. And as she put it in a very nice op-ed piece that uh, she wrote or co-authored, it is very much the sort of elephant in the room, you know, when it comes to discussions around women's economic empowerment and uh, in the post-2015 agenda. So I think we really need to read that report very carefully and lobby, as she told us to do, on all those really, really fundamental issues down to the indicators that we want to have. And I can assure you that on the part of UN women, you know, those are very much the indicators that, that you know, we're lobbying. But, you know, being the secretariat, there's not a lot we can do, and I think it's very important that women's movements from, you know, you lobby your governments, and it's very important that in the negotiations, these issues are kept alive and on the agenda, and we see a clear, visible endorsement of those issues in the agreed conclusions. Uh, so as I said, her report has already covered a lot of ground, and I don't think there's a lot more that I want to elaborate on, but there are two issues that I just thought in the 10 minutes that I'll have, I'll, I'll pick up on and, and say a little bit about. One is the whole issue around policy. How do you, what kind of policy changes do we want? Um, and I think there was a distinction that we made in the UNRIS project that we found quite helpful, was to think about um, care first in terms of uh, sectoral issues, social policies. That's one way of looking at it, and I'll say a little bit about that. But also a different way of looking at it is to think of a care lens and how you even can interrogate the broader economic and macroeconomic policies through a care lens. So let me elaborate a little bit what I mean by those two issues. Uh, first of all, there's clearly some value in having a strong focus on social policy because a lot can be done in terms of taking on board the inequalities uh, in terms of the division of unpaid care work uh, by making sure that your social policy systems assist and, um, and reflect those inequalities and compensate for them if you like. Let's just take, for example, the, the example that Magdalena also referred to now of pensions, old age pensions. Now we know when we look at poverty, 
among people 65 years and above, even in, for example, the European Union, where you have very formalized pension systems, that women end up being, in their older years, significantly poorer than men. Mm -hmm. you know, there's something like 37% higher rates of poverty among women who are um, 65 and older in the EU compared to men. Now, contributory social insurance pensions um, are the most common type of system that we have around the world. Uh, as other pension schemes that kind of benefit, that link the benefits that you get to the number of years that you've contributed in terms of uh, employment, these kind of contributory social insurance pensions very often generate very significant biases against women and also others who engage in other kinds um, you know, of work, which are not necessarily formal work and paid work. If you do informal work, if you do unpaid work, you're basically penalized in your old age because the work that you do has no value when it comes to collecting a pension at the end of, the, of your uh, career. So when social protection entitlements such as pensions are linked directly to paid employment and when there is very weak or insufficient mechanisms that would recognize um, the, uh, and reward the other kinds of contributions that people make to society, like unpaid work, these gender inequalities that are visible in labor markets get transmitted into um, social protection systems in the form of very weak and very low benefits in old age, hence the higher rates of poverty among women. This is quite common in social insurance pensions, and in these types of systems, therefore, gender gaps in labor market participation and earnings generate pension coverage and benefit gaps you know, between women and men. And in some countries, this uh, can especially harm lower income women who tend to have more limited engagement with the formal labor market. They move in and out of paid work because of having children, having elderly parents who need care, or others. And low-income women may also lack access to a derived pension because if they have been in households with men, those men may have been working when they're single or divorced or widowed. And if those men were working as informal workers, that also, in effect, penalizes them in terms of pension coverage and pension rights. We can also think about other sort of more sectoral issues, if you like. Water and sanitation is a very good example. Now. Um, we want to, for example, think about the social investments in infrastructure like water and sanitation. Now, this is absolutely key in terms of reducing the kind of drudgery and burden of unpaid work that women in many uh, poorer, less um, sort of infra areas where there's much less infrastructure development, the kind of burden that is placed on them would be very negatively affected by very limited public investment in this kind of infrastructure. So you need to think about those issues you know, within a kind of more social policy sector, if you like. Other social policy issues that are directly relevant are, for example, investments in public services, such as health care and uh, also child care services, elderly care services. And there's been a lot of work focusing on the kind of arrangements that you need to have in order to make these services not only good quality services, but also accessible to everyone, and not just to those who happen to have um, the purchasing power to be able to go to the market and buy these services. But also I think, you know, to um, move beyond these kind of more social policy issues that again, as I say, are really important. I mean, and we don't want to undervalue the importance that these policy changes can bring in terms of uh, women's entitlements and women's rights to a decent standard of living. For example, to go back to that pension example, you know, there are many ways of making pension systems more um, responsive to the kind of lives that women and many other people have, which doesn't follow the kind of lifelong full-time employment in the formal sector. You can have social pensions, for example, which don't link benefits to how many years you've contributed. We have examples of that in rural Brazil and South Africa, where the benefit is not determined in terms of how many years of paid work you've contributed in the formal labor market. You can also have things like pension credits that would give credit for a number of years taken out doing unpaid care work, for example, in terms of child care. And there have been some interesting reforms in recent years in Latin America. Chile is a good example where such provisions have been put in place. So you can do a lot around those social policy issues. But I think we want to also think um, about sort of broader uh, economic and macroeconomic policy issues and look at it through a care lens. 
Now, I don't want to go into that in, in any depth because I think Radical will pick up on, these, on, on this issue and sort of go uh, and provide much better elaboration of it. Um, but, but we have seen, for example, in the context of the recent um, economic crisis, which was not, of course, the first, you know, other regions have had very recurrent economic and financial crises uh, over the past two or three decades. But the recent financial crisis has shown how the risks and instabilities that are in many ways inherent to a kind of financialized, globalized uh, um, economy and to financial markets that are liberalized and globalized, how these risks and uh, instabilities are transmitted into what some economists call the real economy. And there's been a lot in terms of you know what happens to people's jobs and you know this country in particular and many others have seen these um, impacts. But also we've seen how the kind of fiscal crisis in the private uh, fiscal um, arena in the financial sector, private financial sector, is transmitted into a kind of issue of public financial um, austerity, where because public resources are used to bail out banks, and then what we're seeing in Europe now in a very big way in many parts of Europe is a kind of uh, response in terms of austerity measures that hit those who depend on a lot of the benefits that states give out, whether it's childcare benefits, whether it's uh, housing subsidies, whether it's cuts in healthcare services and cuts in childcare services, care services for the elderly. So all of these fiscal austerity measures have a direct impact in terms of the shifting a lot of the burden onto households, which very often means onto women who have to carry out this constant work of caring now with very few financial benefits that come from the state and also a kind of reduced and retrenched services. So the big financial picture and big macroeconomic policies do matter for, for care. And we need to sort of also think about, you know, looking at them from through a care lens. Just to give another example, um, if you think about something that, you know, we've been doing some uh, work on um, recently, um, what, what are called, some people call them large-scale investments in agricultural land, but we know them more as land grabs. Now, there's been a lot of research on these land grabs that are happening in many parts of the world, and there's, of course, you know, massive dispossession happening. People who have not had formal rights, maybe, to that land, but have had customary rights, who are overnight, you know, they're invisible on these maps and they get deprived of those land rights. There's been a lot of interesting literature and advocacy around those issues. Also, people are deprived you know, of jobs. You know, these big investors come in and promise to create these large-scale agricultural enterprises with the promise that it will provide infrastructure, schools, jobs, etc. Mm -hmm. But much of the research shows that those jobs have not materialized you know, in these very highly mechanized farms, if farms are created, because sometimes it's just for speculation and no production goes on. But even if production goes on, they're very technology intensive, very few jobs are created, there's a bit of contract farming, you know, etc which usually does not you know, really support decent livelihoods. But more importantly, something that has not been commented on very much, there's also a, a systematic kind of disruption of the kind of unpaid work that women do in reproducing their households when their access to water sources are made much more difficult because of these investors moving in and uh, basically cutting off a lot of the places where people live mm -hmm. from water sources take over some of the common pasture lands, take over some of the commons, you know, forests, other uh, areas where women rely on for getting firewood, for cooking, etc. So there's also, a, a, besides the kind of deprivation of rights to land and rights to employment and a decent standard of living, there's also a very important part around unpaid, unpaid work and unpaid domestic work in particular that gets disrupted as a result of these measures. Now we need to look at land grabs what I'm saying is also through a care lens because it has implications in terms of unpaid work. So let me leave the policy issue and quickly go to my second point, which I wanted to raise, which is really about sort of the politics. Um, the global politics are important and please do go and lobby the governments and we will do all our, all our best to get the best that we can out of CSW in order to get these unpaid care issues into the SDGs and uh, we need not underestimate the power that these global global agendas and norms have in terms of legitimizing the work that many of you do also at the national level. If you have an endorsement for unpaid care work here at CSW, it'll make it probably easier to lobby at the national level. But but I do want to raise you know some questions for us to think about maybe in the discussion. 
Now, many of the uh, social policy reforms that, for example, have happened over the past decade in terms of some of the pension reforms that was mentioned that would now reflect better the kind of work that women do and not penalize them for doing unpaid work. Some of the important, really important changes that have happened in um, terms of providing uh, early childhood education and care services um, in many parts of the world. And in particular, when, when we think about a lot of these changes have also happened in, in Latin America that many of us are looking to as very interesting um, experiments. A lot of this has happened and been initiated by left of center governments that have come into power. And, and that has been a very important enabling, enabling factor. Now this is very good news and many of the, when you look very closely, many of these policy changes have by most accounts made a real difference in terms of lives of millions of women. So, so this is something really to be celebrated. However, I mean, if we take a closer look and reading of some of this policy reform literature, it also raises some very interesting questions. And the question, one of the questions that we've been kind of, I've, I've been raising and others have been raising is, you know, where are the movements? Where are the women's movements? And collective action to push for some of these policies that make such a big difference in terms of unpaid care work. Why is it that it has been much easier for women to organize around what Mala Hatun and Laura Weldon, they call it status policies? Things like violence against women, sexual and reproductive rights. It's been much easier for women's movements to organize around these issues than these kind of more redistributive policies to do with provision of decent public care services, to do with reform of pensions. Um, Why are these redistributive policies, therefore, not, not able to kind of resonate and mobilize in the same way that other policies are? Is it, as some have argued, because middle class women have little incentive to mobilize around these issues because they rely on nannies and domestic workers and private crushes and whatever? I don't know. I mean, is that really the reason? Or is it, or is it more because many of those who do very intensive forms of care don't have the right to political participation, as Magdalena would say, they just, they're too time stressed to be able to mobilize for some of these issues. Yeah. And by the time they're, you know, their children are grown up and whatever, they're in movements, you know, that's not such, a, such an issue. I don't know, is that part of the answer? I'm not sure. Or is it that, you know, in a way we have also internalized that care needs and care is something that women and families have to worry about and it's not an issue for public policy. Is it that our movements and we, as individuals, we've also kind of internalized this I don't know, I don't have any answers to any of these questions, um, but I think there are questions that we need to think about and, 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 and worry about in some ways. And why is it also that beyond women's movements and feminist movements, how about other social justice movements, you know, labor movements, are they uh, taking up these issues or are they also maybe resisting it or it's not even on the radar screen? I don't know. These are, I think, important questions for us to, to, really, to really think about. And I think if we do believe that good care is a public good, is, uh, as Nancy Volker would say it, whose benefits spill over, not just to those who receive it, but also to society more broadly, um, and that we know that markets by their very nature will underprovide, especially because those who need most some of these care services are not, do not have the purchasing power to go to markets. So we, need, there needs, we know that there needs to be a much stronger public hand in the provision of these services. Now, if we really believe that, then we really should be asking why we don't have stronger coalition of forces, including more collective action by women, by women's rights, rights advocates, as well as alliances with other social justice movements to demand public responsiveness to the huge deficits and inequalities that mark the care economy in our very divided and fractured societies. We really need to be, I think, asking that question. And as important as the global arena is, I think we also need to be worrying about why there's not enough advocacy and push and collective action around these issues at the national level. Thank you. We've had two rallying calls um, through these two presentations, one around lobbying and also around mobilization now, um, both at the international and national level. I'm going to invite Deepta to come up um, for her presentation. Thanks very much.
Um, thank you very much for um, giving us this opportunity and um, for all of you for sparing the time to come and discuss this really important issue. Uh, I'm going to focus my comments uh, again, you know, like from taking off from, from where Magdalena uh, and Shara left off on concentrating on what social policies mean. Uh, for what, what do they mean and what do they look like when you actually incorporate care? Uh, I'm going to focus on, on two, um, two sectors, actually, uh, and, uh, and probably leave the, the macroeconomic uh, policies to Radhika at her, in, her, in her interventions. Um, but uh, in terms of, I mean, so, so thinking about, uh, well, starting with uh, early childhood um, uh, education or early childhood care, um, Magdalena said that the rights of, rights of carers are, inter, are deeply intertwined with those of the rights of providing care. Uh, and that's really where, where I want to come up, which is basically make the argument that women's rights and children's rights directly influence each other. However, there's been such few successes at tackling these agendas collaboratively, and that limits not only the achievement of women's rights, but also limits the achievement of child rights. And, and that they, these are, uh, and that um, integrating unpaid care concerns actually into early childhood development policies has the potential to positively reinforce both women's and child right, children's rights. Um, we did a review at IDS of all the policies. We were actually looking for those success cases that Chara uh, mentioned, saying, okay, where are, the, where, where are the cases that we can draw positive examples from um, around the world? Uh, and we looked at uh, 263 policies across 163 countries, which are all low and middle income countries in the world. Um, and we found that out of those 263 policies, only 40, that is less than 15% of policies had an explicit recognition of care. So the, the, the value, this, you know, forget, you know, like, so, so how Magdalena said, you know, we need to value care, we need to support care and share it. Well, we, there was not even a value of care in, 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 in more than 15% of those policies. So that's saying something. Um, and, and, you know, and there, are, there, are, there are issues about why these have not been taken into account. But what I wanted to really focus on was, okay, so what do these policies look like if they have been taken, uh, if care has been taken into account? And these really fall into four areas. Um, one is provision of community-run and state-run childcare centers. Um, so examples uh, include uh, the Garden of Mothers and Children in Albania, where there are low-cost community-based centers that serve young children and their families. Uh, they also encourage men to take active fathering roles through boards of fathers. There's also Chile Creque Contigo, which is Chile Grows With You. Again, a similar program which recognizes childcare not only as a shared responsibility between men and women, but a shared responsibility of the state, the community, and families. Uh, and again, supports fathers in playing an active role for caring for their children. Um, the second group of uh, ECD policies that really integrate unpaid care talk very specifically about the role of encouraging men uh, to take, take an active role. And uh, countries like Jordan and Ukraine both have ECD policies which list several concrete ways in which fathers can help in childcare, including actually preparing meals, spending time with children. Um, Ukraine has Papa Schools, which provides training for fathers to encourage them to take a greater role in ECD um, centers. Um, the third group is is on uh, is on supporting uh, you know ECD centers, which say that we we're set up so that women can go out into the labor force. So the discourse is very much about supporting women's economic participation. Um, countries like Botswana, Ethiopia, Ghana have early childhood care and education policies that respond and say that we're responding to poor and disadvantages women's need to for time so that they can engage in other productive uh, activities. Of course, Cuba is one of the great, uh, you know, great and, and oldest examples. I mean, Cuba's children's circles were established in 1961, uh, and they were providing institutional care for the sons and daughters of working mothers. Uh, why I'm giving you specific country examples is because these are these are opportunities that you can say, well, you've got this already. You know, so when you lo when you go out and lobby these governments and maybe you can kind of use these examples and um, uh, and many more, uh, right? Um, so in terms of the fourth group, there's also a very important recognition that we found uh, was in Bangladesh of recognizing the role of children as carers. So it was not just women, um, you know, who, and older women who would care, but also other children. And uh, in Bangladesh, under their uh, what's called the Primary Education Development Program 2, which is PEDP2, Primary schools actually incorporate um, 
informal baby classes, which enable older siblings to bring their younger siblings to, to, to the same school, and the elder child goes into, um, into school, into primary school, and the younger child goes into baby classes. So that's another really positive example. Um, those are, the, those are the examples from the ECD sector, and uh, there's some literature that, that is up here uh, on, on, on this, and there's, you know, there's details of 40 policies, so if, you, if you're interested, please come up uh, and, and ask, and we'd be happy to share those examples with you. Um, I'm moving on to um, the second sector that we looked at, which was social protection. Now, um, again, unpaid care work and social protection are so intrins intrinsically linked. Um, not only because social protection um, and their provisions help to alleviate the drudgery and the burden that poor women uh, face uh, with unpaid care work, and Shara gave examples of water and sanitation, uh, you know, and, and this can be done through, say, public works programs, kind of like, you know, digging a water well or, uh, you know, reservoir or you know access to to various water sources um, but also because uh, women's I mean what what social protection policies most often forget is that it takes time and effort to access those provisions if um, you know, I was in Nepal trying to trying to work with the, the Nepal government on its social protection framework, and the, the discourse was all about, well, you know, we need to we, we need to make this efficient. So, you know, we can have uh, we can have say uh, banks uh, who can who can you know we can be money through banks, but. But and, and you know they didn't have they didn't hadn't really thought about the fact that somebody has to go and especially the women they have to go to the bank walk about you know four miles five miles to this bank it takes three hours uh, on the way there three hours on the way back to collect what um, three hundred Nepali rupees which is about two dollars I mean you know so so we we need to kind of make sure that you know these things are are, are sensitive uh, to unpaid care and and make sure that this fits into our programming so again as as um, the previous speakers kind of said, you know that, that there was a rallying call around uh, advocacy for um, for integrating unpaid care work into policies, uh, both at global levels and, and at national levels. I think there is a real need for development practitioners to build unpaid care work into their programming as well. So it's not just somebody out there who does policies. It's, it's all of us who, who build uh, programs around unpaid care. Um, just to give you some, um, some figures, uh, again, we reviewed 149 social protection policies, out of which there were only 23 which even uh, mentioned or had any care lens onto them. Uh, so that's 21%. Um, and again, most of them, yes, were in Sub-Saharan Africa as well as in Latin America. Um, some positive examples. Um, Again, four categories. Uh, there was the, uh, you know, the, the, there were a few examples, and, and uh, I believe that uh, the Argentina's uh, Universal Family Allowance uh, per, per Child program has worn down or shut down. I'm not, I'm not too sure. I need to check that. But what they did have, if they, if they still have that, is a monthly care allowance for parents who were in unemployed, and specifically for women who were employed in the informal sector. So there was a very clear recognition that women are less likely to participate in formal labor markets, and therefore. Uh, needed to have um, um, this this allowance directed to them. Um, we often hear of conditional cash transfers, uh, and that's our second group of programs. Uh, now, conditional cash transfers, for all the reasons that uh, we know, are deeply problematic because they 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 reinforce the maternal role of uh, of women, saying, well, you know, women have well, children. Conditionalities are usually. Children have to be brought to school, children have to be taken to healthcare centers, and therefore, of course, the burden falls on the woman to take, take, these, um, um, take, take, the, take them to, uh, to these centers. Um, Egypt's uh, Ayn El Sira pilot conditional cash transfer program was the only program that we found uh, which, uh, which actually ta was targeted at women and female heads of households uh, and, uh, and provided compensation for any time that was spent in fulfilling program conditionalities. Uh, and in addition, parents would receive more money for keeping, say, girls in school or above keeping boys in schools. Uh, and uh, the, some of these, um, the, the program also had provisions for building in both male and female heads of households to encourage uh, to visit them uh, in health clinics and attend nutrition talks. Um, public works programs, that are, that's our third category. Uh, again, uh, public works programs are usually um, designed to not, they're, they're completely care blind. Right, uh, but there, there, there are a few examples. Uh, one in India, one in Bangladesh. 
uh, Bangladesh's Rural Employment Opportunities for Public Assets, or REOPA, uh, is a program where women workers are provided maternity leave and are also included in needs assessment, which takes into account their household and reproductive responsibilities. Um, India's Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Program uh, provides a crash at worksite so that women are able to balance their childcare responsibilities with work. Now, um, having said this about, about India's uh, NGNIG, it's actually my area of work, and what we realized was that it's not enough to put a policy provision in place. Right? Uh, India's uh, public works program, this one, has the most intensive monitoring and evaluation um, database that, that one can ever think of. The one thing that they do not monitor on is how many crashes. So when you go to the field, you will not find any crashes anywhere in India. Like it's just it's just not there. And so you know, like we've we've managed to, and there's a whole history of like you know why and how uh, you know women's movements actually rallied around this call for for putting childcare provisions, but kind of we stopped there. We didn't go one step further to say okay, this should also be monitored. Right? And so we, we brought the policy provisions in, but we, we weren't able to ensure its implementation. Um, social transfers, uh, Shara's already uh, given you a few examples. Uh, uh, but in terms of even social pensions, there is uh, Kenya and South Africa both have, um, not, not social pensions, sorry, they both have uh, social transfer programs for families taking care of orphaned and vulnerable children. But in terms of social uh, social pensions, there is El Salvador's Pension Besica Universal, which in addition to delinking this uh, the pension provision with their paid uh, with the paid work contributions, also provides training and support for family members to, to, to make sure that there's a better environment for both the elder person and the family. Unfortunately, we did not find any recognition of the fact that older women are also caring for the um, you know the grandchildren and that that recognition was just not there in social policy so that's another area co concretely that one could really um, think about and say okay why is this not there and maybe it needs to be there um, I'm gonna end uh, and my comments here we will uh, we'll show you at the end uh, also a movie that or oh, an animation it's a short short four minute animation at the end uh, to, to just highlight these issues and, and see, see maybe we, we want you to use this as a tool, so if you want copies, please come up and we'll tell you where you can get, get copies of this from. So, thank you very much. Thank you, Deepa. Radical. Thank you very much. I have to say that the, all three presentations have been so excellent that it's got me thinking and that I need to change what I was going to say a little bit. Um, they kind of stole a little bit of my thunder. Um, and so my, my job here is sort of to pull the attention from kind of the micro to the macro issues that um, are um, intrinsic in unpaid work. And so um, we need to you know, I, I, I'm, I'm reflecting on, their, on all the things that they've said. And so, you know, uh, Shara said, why don't we pay attention to redistribution? And I, think, and I think that's a really important call that she made. And I think some of that call is in order to talk about redistribution, we need to talk about economic policy. Right? We can't talk about redistribution outside of the context of the larger economic policy framework that we're all living in. And that's a not an easy thing to do because there's vested interest in keeping the things the way they are right now. And so um, in order to talk about unpaid work and redistribution, we need to talk about macro policy and how do we talk about the, the change in, in macro policy. Magdalena talked about, you know, the the issue of recognizing unpaid work. And so, but that requires uh, statistics. We need to measure unpaid work. That's not an easy thing to do. We need to have larger time use surveys to really capture how unpaid work is done, especially when it is combined with paid work. That it's not usually that you go to work and you come back and do paid work. Often your child is sitting next to you when you're doing informal work, so how do you uh, and what are the policy implications of actually measuring it? Uh, many people have talked about reducing it, 
and that could be through public infrastructure. But public infrastructure means that there needs to be budget allocations for public, you know, infrastructure. <coughs> they don't come in the absence of, of money. And appropriate services like crushes and other things that everyone has talked about. But again, that recognize and reducing, reducing actually requires public policy to to reduce it. It doesn't it's not gonna happen by magic. And the last is the redistribution of unpaid care work, which is the equal sharing in the household, but also then it is about changing uh, a, a certain kind of mindset that that you know, caring work is something that everyone can do. Uh, the MDGs, as many people have said, um, <laughs> were really uh, not adequate. I think I'm being polite uh, <laughs> by saying that they weren't that great. And, and of course, had nothing to, I mean, they ignored a lot of issues that on gender uh, inequality, but definitely nothing in terms of uh, unpaid care work and how it shapes the, the daily lives. Um, a few people have talked about the problems with conditional cash transfers and how it puts the burden on women as the ones who had to ensure that kids go to school. But the other part of the conditional cash transfers that talk about the macro policy is that whenever there are these crises, conditional cash transfers become the program that is supposed to deal with the, the, the fallout. Mm -hmm. Well, those are gendered and have some implications on unpaid care work. So, you know, whenever, I think, um, uh, Shara probably knows this way better than I do, but uh, the World Bank's, you know, program on, on crises is all about conditional cash transfers, you know, and so uh, rather than saying, what do we need to do to prevent a crisis? <laughs> It's more how do we have these social programs that will take care of it that have a gendered implication in terms of how they're constructed and how they're implemented. Um, and so in terms of uh, the crises, I want to, you know, uh, the, the sort of crises that uh, has come out of the financial crisis in the U.S., but, but as Sara said, the crises that have happened around the world for a long time, uh, the responses uh, to those crises do not take into account the, the kind of issues that we need to pay attention to in terms of unpaid care work. So uh, currently, the, the discourse on economic crises is that we need austerity, right? Everywhere, in Europe, everywhere, and, and uh, the governments are deciding for themselves that austerity is the answer and you have to cut uh, public expenditure. But that actually has a huge implication on non-paid care work. And so how, you know, who, when some, I mean, this is sort of an old feminist economist example is that, you know, when you cut expenditure on public health, who is going to take care of sick people? And right. there's a lot of really great feminist economic analysis that says, you know, it's not that uh, macroeconomic policy is gender blind, they actually understand that women are going to take care of the sick and it increases the amount of work that women do. And so it is on the backs of women that austerity programs are being put into place. And so we need to say, sorry, that can't happen and this is not gonna be free. So when we talk about austerity, we have to talk about it in terms of the expansion of women's unpaid, uh, unpaid work. Also, austerity means that often um, uh, childcare uh, places are closed. So then who ends up taking care of the childcare place? I remember talking to a colleague of mine uh, working in Spain, and because of the austerity programs in Spain, a lot of the childcare places were closed, and so were the domestic violence crisis centers. Mm -hmm. And so she, and so the one place that she could go to was far away that she could go and try and get help, but there were no places for her to leave her kids in order to try to get out of a violent household. And so the cutting of those expenditures has huge impacts, right? It's not, it's the real lives of people. It's not sort of an abstract concept that, oh, there's this random group of people who are going to be taking care of things. Family incomes fall during crises. Uh, formal employment and benefits decrease which means informal employment increases. I'll give you an example from some work I did a while ago, uh, right after the financial crisis in Asia. 
there were these formal factories that had uh, unionized workers that closed because of the, of the crisis in Asia. And uh, I was doing some research on informal sector workers, and what I found was that a lot of those unionized workers were now in subcontracted small shops the same workers actually producing the same things that they did as unionized workers and they're in small shops and literally their child is sitting on the sewing machine while they're sewing and playing with scissors i completely i was like wait that's a little kid with scissors but uh the 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 unionized work had actual crushes where they had their kids and now that's gone and so the wages went down informal sector work went up and the the responsibility for childcare has become part of the job. And so actually one of the NGOs that we were working with uh, tried to get these children into sort of after school programs or gave them milk and cookies in the afternoon to try and organize these workers in a different way. So I think we need to think about this. Um, um, several people brought um, of tax policies. Tax policies have a huge impact, right? And more and more people are talking about having VAT taxes as the way to increase the amount of income. But VAT taxes, you know, is poor people end up paying a larger portion of taxes on consuming goods, and so then reduces their income, and then the income then decreases their ability to to function. Um, and uh, and I think one of the things that this crisis is really showing us now in terms of the discourse is there's sort of I think a move away from uh, a conversation on social protection universal social protection not these targeted you know only poor people get but we have universal social protection Magdalena's done I mean we're all everyone here has done some really great work on that so you should definitely look at, at their work um, and then you know what happens to uh, human capacity when uh, women's uh, labor is considered completely elastic, right? So, you, you, oh, you have a crisis? Well, then they'll just work 28 hours, even though there's only 24. So there's an assumption of women's uh, elasticity of women's labor to take the brunt of the crisis. And I think we need to bring that up as a part of the post-2015 agenda. I mean, um, you know, one of, I, I feel like, the, the conversations that we're having at the CSW, which is the, the challenges of, uh, of the MDGs, is really setting the stage for what's coming next, right? The post-2015 agenda. And if, I mean, I agree with everyone, we have to put unpaid care work in that post-2015 agenda. But if we don't put that care work in the context of absolute economic policy change, then we're getting a micro solution to a macro problem. And so we have to challenge the system at its heart and do it from what Shara said, a care lens, right? I mean, a care lens makes you look all over the place and it looks at global economic policy, the way trade policies land grabbing, all of these issues come up when we look at it in the care lens. And we have to do that kind of analysis and lobbying. We cannot, I really feel like, especially as women's movements, and I think Shara challenged us a little bit in terms of how come we're very good at, at looking at sort of um, uh, uh, violence against women and, and, uh, and uh, uh, sexual reproductive health and not as good at doing the others. I think we are good at doing the other. I think we just have to do more of it and we have to become really loud. Uh, and I think, uh, the, the, and, and you know what, there is no time like now to be that loud because if this next 2015 agenda is the same old <laughs> that we had before, we're in trouble. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole world's in trouble. So if we don't sort of stand up and get to the streets and do whatever it is that we need to do, we're in trouble. And then the last thing I wanted to say, again, responding to Shara's call on organizing, there's actually <laughs> great organizing. And I think we need to sort of look at uh, the organizing of domestic workers. And the domestic workers in the United States, the bills that have happened in the United States, but the global policies on domestic workers has a lot to do with care work and unpaid work. Uh, the, there's now an international organization of unions trying to organize domestic workers, which is huge. Uh, and uh, more recently, uh, there's an organization in the U.S. that just started that's called Caring Across Generations. And it comes out of the domestic workers groups. 
and they are trying to look at the aging population that's, that's coming in the U.S. and the care work and the fact that a lot of the care work are people who, are, who migrate here to take care of the elderly here and how do we do a cooperative um, kind of assessment of the kind of care that you know the, the population in the U.S. is aging, the baby boomers are aging. And they need good care work, but a lot of, I mean, care work is expensive, but at the same time, people are paid really low amount of wages. So how do you enhance the quality of the care work, unionize those workers, get union workers together with having a partnership for the people who demand the care and the people who provide it. So, and, and so if you have not looked at them, please look up their website. They're new, they're fantastic, they're challenging the macro policies, but also organizing from the ground up. And, and this is a worker-led a movement. So I just I want us to sort of think about the, the encouraging things of the kind of organizing and maybe they're not lobbying at the UN but they're organizing on the ground and I think that's where we need to do both. We need to organize on the ground and also at the UN. Thanks. Thank you so much to our four speakers. I think that they have reminded us all how political this agenda is, um, how political it is in terms of linking unpaid care work to human rights, but also how political it is to actually use and adopt a care lens, be it to apply to social policy, economic policy, and also how much organizing is already happening, but that we can, and I will take Radhika's words, be louder. And I think that's really key and a, a good takeaway from this discussion. So I'm going to quickly uh, just show the video that was that Deepta mentioned, and then we're just going to open up to questions.
Thank you to IDS for pulling that together. Oops, sorry. Um, I'm just going to take a, a first round of three questions. Um, yeah, I'll start. I'll start here. Sorry, and then you, and then. Hi there. Uh, thanks. Uh, I'm a student from the Harvard School of Public Health, and I'm really inspired to see that the importance of uh, um, baby, uh, care work uh, is being brought up, and I do believe that we need more lobbying and more mobilization, since uh, this is a serious uh, violation of human rights, and we often overlook this uh, impact and also the impact to health. And, um, I want to share one of the good examples of the practice that uh, come out of the CSW, so as an encouragement for everyone. <laughs> uh, so uh, in, uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, women's groups from Taiwan that's been coming to the uh, CSW for many years. And since uh, 1995, Taiwan has uh, uh, established the national attention uh, for uh, Taiwan, but uh, they didn't include uh, domestic worker or other uh, group, but uh, in uh, starting from 2000, the women's group in Taiwan they, who have been coming to the CSW and have uh, uh, recognized the gender inequality of uh, the labor market and also the low participation rate of uh, female in the labor market. So they start to lobby for the change of the National Pension Act. And uh, from 2000 to 2005, through um, uh, many discussion, and they also come up a plan um, to change, to amend the National Pension Act. And in 2008, they have uh, expanded the National Pension Act to include domestic workers and also um, people with disability and uh, part-time work. So this is the great work that we have been doing. So uh, I think uh, some of the changes may not be so um, uh, visible, but they have been really good progress. Thank you for that. Uh, my name is Pat Carroll, and I'm from Grand Biscuit, and um, also in a unique position that I was a stay home dad for about five years. So I got to experience coming back to work. Hold on one second. You're going to have to speak up so okay. that everyone can hear. Sorry. I, um, I had the experience of being a stay at home dad for a number of years. So when I went back to work, first of all, um, working in corporate America, I lost a lot of time and could not go back to the level I was at and ended up having to get out of corporate America. But also, I look at you know my benefits going forward, like Social Security. I realize how much I lost by not working for those five years. Um, my question is, I look around this room, and I notice that there are three men here. <laughs> and so you know we're all from organizations. We all represent lots of people. The last week we talked about organizing. Maybe we ought to start organizing within our own organizations, so that in the future, you know, you're preaching to the choir now. Maybe we. You know, when there's a women's conference, we don't just look in our organizations and say, oh, you four are the women, you go to the women's conference. And we start sending men to these conferences, to these workshops, and getting loud within our own organizations for us to call it for this issue. Great, thank you. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to appreciate the, that there was a kind of a discussion around um, organizing women as, as caregivers. Um, as an important piece of moving forward any policy agenda, and I think it's very important that any policy agenda is driven by women who are organizing on the ground. So I wanted to actually defer, I have a lot of comments, but I wanted to defer to some of the leaders of uh, the Home-Based Care Alliance who are representing over 30,000 caregivers organized in uh, 12 countries in Africa who are sitting next to me, uh, who have been organizing on this issue for 10 plus years uh, in the context of HIV. It'll be great to hear. Okay, thank you so much, Becca, for getting. I was in a corner and the person who was <laughs> allowing people to speak could not see me. Okay, I think um, I just want directly to answer uh, Shara Razavi. Yeah, because your question was how, why isn't the women movement taking? the care and paid care work like vigorously the way they are taking the women's rights, the violence agenda. I think it's because we come from different contexts. And when this unpaid care work came to the CSW, as caregivers, women who have been working in Africa where HIV struck and women took 
on the burden of caring for people living with HIV AIDS, which was, of course, then uh, even accelerated with many things, including a huge number of orphans, including even the work that you have been talking about, fetching water, all this, but in the context of not just your family, outside your family, caring for people who are in need, when the, uh, the health facilities or uh, health was actually really fragmented and there was no way people could be put to hospital, particularly in the context of our African situation. And when this discussion came to the table, all of us were showing the different kind of care that is happening, the unpaid care work in various contexts. But now it is narrowing down and it is actually because where you are talking about, I'm also placed there as a woman, but also on my other part as a caregiver. I don't see myself being reflected there in the context of HIV AIDS. So if we want to achieve this agenda, let's team together and ensure that we are bringing all the contexts and situations of unpaid care work in the situation of public care work where we are caring for families that have burdens in are burdened with HIV AIDS, but we are also showing the unpaid care work of women as housewife and domestic workers, all this, so that it's packed together and it can move to the table and all of us can support it. But the moment I feel like the huge, the biggest burden, where the biggest burden of unpaid care work is lying, is not coming to the table, then I don't feel myself like really supporting it vigorously the way I would want to do to women rights. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, my name is Barbara Byers. I'm with the Canadian Labor Congress. Uh, it, two fast points. I'm really pleased to see the connection with childcare uh, really heavily emphasized because what we do know is that if we don't have childcare, uh, it's very difficult for women to get into a workplace no matter where they are. And I would encourage people uh, to go to just Google something called Rethink Child Care, which the unions have been working on and community groups have been working on in Canada. Uh, and what we do know is that, for example, in the province of Quebec, uh, that has had $5 a day child care and now $7 a day child care, uh, that before they started their program, they had the worst participation rate of women in the workplace. Ten years later, or ten years after, they had the best participation rate may have had something to do with, with child care. And I think it also emphasizes to us that because somebody is also is in unpaid work, whatever that may be, doesn't mean that they don't need child care. Uh, there's still uh, that reality. So that was number one. The other one is that one of the speakers raised about where is the trade union movement. I think that right it's, it's uh, about <laughs> us trying to organize together. Uh, about our on this because what oftentimes happens is uh, governments, at least the current government we have in Canada, which if you listen to their speech this afternoon, it's not going to be really the country that I live in. So. No. <laughs> so, uh, but, but governments end up pitting us against each other. They devise things that they say are good for families, but what do they really mean in terms of tax policy, benefits, uh, all sorts of things? It's good for women of privilege and families of privilege. So what they do is they appeal to predominantly, again, mothers who are stay-at-home um, that, uh, that think that the trade union movement is in opposition to them getting the rights. And I think we have to have more of these discussions to say what our collective desires are as working class women and working class families. Because governments do a really good job of saying they're concerned about families but they're really only concerned about uh, one grouping of families. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> it's very difficult for me to follow our leader from Canada. I'm also from Canada. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for drawing our attention to make care a central lens in our social policies, in our policies. Uh, I am going to speak here as a minority woman living in Canada and coming to CSW for the last no, you're, you're years. For the last years. Just say, yeah. 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 So the whole, I have to, have to take you away from care to the whole politics of human rights. 
the international politics and hypocrisy about human rights. What are human rights and who is violating them? When it comes to that, you would see a very much colonial, endocentric view of dividing the world into two groups. One is human rights violators, and us, Canada, United States, as the champion of human rights. <laughs> and the issue that you are raising is why care work has not been receiving as much attention in our movement is our own internalization of Eurocentric colonial lens which we as the Western feminist movement have not yet freed ourselves. It's so good to see all of you here. Uh, you all come uh, maybe related to the countries which were colonized and you can really see that. But such a conversation which is free of the colonialist uh, Eurocentric lens, I have not yet heard very much in the discourses here. I keep hearing uh, what a lucky people we are in Canada and we are really champion of human rights. I see sisters from the United States condemning uh, Yemen for not being pro-democratic while democracy is really being eroded in this country as well as in my country. So I think we really have to raise that issue whenever we have conversation about why we are dividing human rights into two categories. One is privilege and other and the other is not privilege. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna hand it over to anyone who wants to respond to those questions. Any anything to add? Closing statements? I, I just wanted to add something to this last comment. I think the, the, the division in human rights, of uh, civil and political rights, and economic and social rights is the division that you're speaking about. And I think that the work that Magdalena has been doing as a special rapporteur in extreme poverty has really pushed the agenda of extreme poverty. I mean, look, I'm a huge fan of her work, and she knows that. And but it's not just this report, but every report that she's done since she's been the Special Rapporteur has pushed the boundaries by which human rights norms can look at economic policy at a global level. So um, I think it's that divide between civil and political rights and economic and social rights. So I think when we do the lobbying that we're going to be doing in the next two weeks is to really do our lobbying in terms of economic and social and cultural rights, in terms of the new post-2015 agenda. And we have quite a few publications on how we do this uh, at the center's uh, website. So uh, cwgl.rutgers.edu. So if you need some, cwgl.rutgers.edu has a, um, a bunch of recommendations on how to do that. And then tomorrow, uh, there's going to be the release of at uh, that uh, Rachel had talked about, the expert group meeting report. Uh, that's going to be released tomorrow with recommendations that also do that. Um, I just wanted to pick up and reinforce the, the, the links between the child care that was the, um, and the women's rights issue. I think um, the, uh, the issue is not just to provide any child care. It has to be good quality child care. Because it's not, it's not that, you know, I mean, we're, we're not looking for, I don't think we're looking for just uh, somewhere to kind of like just, you know, deposit our children. I think it's, you know, and then and then go to work. I think it's about, it's, it's about having the confidence that they are being well cared for. It's about the quality of care, but it's also about the choice, right? I mean, women, Exactly, they, they may choose to, to leave their children, and, and, and Magdalena's report talks about the right to leisure. It is, it is very important. We don't just have to go to work after we, you know, or, or clean the house or do all these other things that we need to do. We also need time to rest, and I think that is a human right in itself, and that we shouldn't forget. And just, just a very brief point to say that I think the, the questions and comments from the floor, as well as 
a lot of what Radhika also said, I think there were really excellent examples to say that actually there is a lot of politics and mobilization around care issues. Look carefully, look at domestic workers, look at home-based care givers, um, look at community organizers, and that there is a lot of organization and mobilization going on. And I think we need to I mean, celebrate that, but also you know, bear in mind that the contexts are very different and it may not register if you're looking for a particular form of organization around the need for child care. You know, other kinds of organization and mobilization are going on may not come on your register, but you need to really expand that lens and look for different contexts and different kinds of mobilizations that, that are going on. And I think I learned a lot from that discussion and I appreciate all the comments that came. On, on mobilization, I think that there is also uh, important issues that we should stress. For example, uh, if, if we promote time use surveys, uh, that will also be important to help mobilizing. I mean, if women uh, were having the data about how much time they're, uh, they're doing unpaid care work and, and about the double shift that they do when they go back home after working, it will help to, uh, to identify uh, with the issue. It will help also to, to mobilize. So we should keep on pushing for, uh, for good time surveys that will help on, on, on the issue of mobilizing. Uh, because there is a lot of work to do in, in changing the, the paradigms and changing the, the, the structural discrimination that uh, underpins uh, the fact that women are uh, considered the one that should nurture and do the child, the, 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 not to do the unpaid care work uh, by themselves. Thank you. Great. We've come to the end of our session, so I just wanted to thank our panelists, first of all. Thank you very much for this presentation. And thank you to everyone who's come to this session. I think it's really showing us that we are moving forward on unpaid care work. I don't think we could have, I don't, no, I'm not going to say that, but I think it's wonderful that you guys are here. Thank you very much. <laughs>